In Africa, a quarter of the world, men's skins are black, their hair is crisp and curled. And somewhere there, unknown to public view, a mighty city lies called Timbuktu. When William Thackeray wrote these lines in the 19th century, fevered speculation about Timbuktu was at its height. For hundreds of years, Europe had been captivated by stories of a mysterious city buried deep in the heart of black Africa. European explorers raced to be the first to reach the fabled city of Timbuktu. When I was growing up, Timbuktu was a magical name for black people. The men in my neighborhood used to sit around at Mr. Comey's barbershop talking about the existence of a great university just on the edge of the Sahara Desert in blackest Africa. When Europe was in its Middle Ages, Africans were flocking to this university. You have these visions of Africans with these great turbans and these great robes surrounded by thousands and thousands of books, and it was our people. And then they would go on to say, there's stuff in these books the white man don't want us to know about. My journey begins on the banks of the mighty river Niger in Bamako, capital of Mali in West Africa. I'll travel the old trade routes following in the footsteps of those first European explorers. I'm heading 700 miles northeast down the Niger to Timbuktu, once known as the most distant place on the face of the earth. Tales of gold led to Timbuktu's fame fueling the imagination and the greed of European explorers. Once all the gold in medieval Europe came from this part of Africa, and gold is still mined in the forests south of Bamako. What? That's the gold right there. Oh? Yeah, wow, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a whole row of gold. Maybe he, uh, see, can you see now? Yeah, I see it. And it's full of it. It looks like, um, looks like the stars. <laughs> Mali's ancient gold mines were the stuff of legend. One Malian king was said to have a nugget of gold so huge that he could tether his horse to it. Mm -hmm. 
Juan, so he just crawled straight up the hole. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know yet because of this is the soil and it has been washed there. Oh, I see. So he brings up the soil. He mines the soil. Mm -hmm. It's brought up in buckets. Yeah. And then the women wash it. Yeah. Ah. Do you ever get frightened? Yeah, no, you be stranded. Okay, stranded. It's a stranded woman. Frightened about, uh, frightened about what? Eh, I cannot be kind. Eh, just go out today. Ah, it's part of the work. It's part of the work. It's part of the work. Yeah, well, good luck. Oh, kiliche. Kwala kiso. Until today, my idea of a gold mine had come from Westerns. It's hard to believe that these men still spend their days crawling through suffocating mud tunnels, which have a habit of caving in. And these days, the returns are pretty slim. That's beautiful. How much is this worth? Uh -huh. It's worth uh, 500 here. So that's one dollar. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Bamako is the capital of one of the poorest nations in the world. But Mali was once a wealthy empire, one of the greatest on the face of the earth. It stretched 1,500 miles across West Africa. The empire was founded in the 13th century by King Sundiata. Mali's musicians still sing about this national hero. This funky bar reminds me of a juke joint back home. But if these are the blues, they are African blues. I ask Bubakar Traore why he sings about Sundiata. Il y a d'autres gens qui peuvent connaître très bien l'histoire de Sunyata. Il y a d'autres qui traduisent comme ça, il y a d'autres qui traduisent comme ça. Mais pour moi, je sais que je suis descendant de Sunyata. C'est pourquoi j'ai senti les chansons de Sunyata. Did you say that you were descended from Sunyata? Oui, tous les Maliens se sont des descendants de Sunyata. Le croire, oui. On est fiers de ça. I follow the course of the Niger River, heading for the market town of Mopti. The River Niger has always been Mali's lifeblood, its main trading artery, as it weaves its way from west to east. The 
these days, trade has virtually dried up. A century of colonialism and military rule has brought Mali to its knees. But in 1991, democracy was established, and perhaps Mali's fortunes will rise again. As we get closer to the Sahara Desert, forest gives way to scorching savanna. I'm looking forward to the air conditioning in my hotel room. Does the fan work? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Okay. This is the honeymoon suite. <laughs> Mopti was a sleepy fishing town before the French made it their downriver capital at the end of the 19th century. Today it's the busiest market between Bamako and Timbuktu, attracting people from Mali's many ethnic groups. Like food, peanuts, a lot of things, and the Bozo people, and Tuareg people, and you know, Fulani people, very, very mixed. You know, Mopti is a very, very mixed town. So it's we're not to have just one people, one city. Umar Sisse is one of the town's town. most successful yeah. businessmen. He offered to show me the remnants of the old Trans Saharan trade in salt and gold. And you can wear it to show the people. NSA. Many people still keep their wealth in gold. The Fulani literally wear their family's riches on their ears. Honestly? Jawali, you tell him Jawali. Jawali. That is like good morning in Fulani. What are they? That is the gold. Wow. That's gold? Yeah, that's real gold. You can touch to see. I can touch it? Yeah. Why? Remember the Jawali? Wow. And the nice That's design. all gold? Real all gold. How much does that cost? Oh, 140 yards. 140 no. Calcium. It's like a, it's come to like a 2 million, it's like $4,000. $4,000? That's a lot of money. Yeah. But it was salt, not gold, that created the ancient trade routes. We got a little small product. Ah, see. It's fixed it in a machine. What's that? It's just salt. It's hard to believe, but salt was in such demand in medieval Mali that it was once exchanged ounce for ounce for gold. That is the big boat, the traveling and the people going to Timbuktu, Masina, a lot of places. How long does it take to get to Timbuktu from here? Uh, Sometimes, when it gets a lot of water, it's a two and a half day, two days. Two days? Yeah. And that boat? Yeah. These great slabs of salt are mined deep in the Sahara Desert far to the north of Timbuktu. The salt is dug by the dark-skinned Bella, but the trade is controlled by their traditional masters, the nomadic Tuareg. So he's from near Timbuktu? Timbuktu. But how come, uh, Omar, how come he's, he looks different from him? They're both Tuareg? No, this is like uh, Bella, they think like that. You see his slave? Yeah. A slave. Ah, I see. So this man owns him? Yeah, uh, like that. Huh. So he's born into slavery? Exactly. Hmm. It's a trip of trip. Father to son to big father. It's not illegal? No, it's a traditional. Traditional? Yeah, it's traditional. Hmm. Oh, well, my great-great-grandfather was a slave. 
Yeah, man. Now you and America. Now it's finished for that. Yeah. Man, for these people, it's traditional. If everything he have to do, he have to go in to ask a friend. He have to ask uh, the have real ask person. Him. Yeah. He have to say the do real that person. and don't do that. You think like that? Hmm. Like that. So does he pay him or? Do yeah, he pay him too. He pays him too. Mm -hmm. But this man, if he wanted to quit and work on the river, he couldn't do that unless he said yes. Sometimes he can say yes. Sometimes he can say no. Mm -hmm. And the Bella people know rebellion. They never want to fight the tour. No, no, no. He like that. They it's like interesting. It? Yeah, for her. Yeah, they used to say that about Black American slaves too. <laughs> <laughs> this is about as close to slavery as I hope I ever get. Molly may be rich in history, but this is one legacy of the past that could sure do without. Later, Umar takes me out on the town to see a griot in concert. Griots are poets who sing the praises of their wealthy patrons. It's a tradition that goes back to the earliest kingdoms, before the written word. These epics, passed down from generation to generation, are the main source of Mali's early history. These days, Rios praise anyone who shows them the money. First she sings about Umar, and then she starts singing about me. I paid her enough to be remembered for the next 500 years. I set off for the ancient city of Jene, 80 miles upriver from Mopti. In the Middle Ages, Jene was a great center of trade. All of the gold and salt going to and from Timbuktu had to pass through this town. Mali's fame spread like wildfire in the reign of the great king, Mansa Musa. In the 14th century, Mansa Musa made a pilgrimage from Timbuktu to Mecca with an entourage of 500 slaves, each carrying a staff of pure gold. He gave away so much gold when he passed through Cairo that its price slumped for 12 years. On his return journey, the king ordered a mosque to be built every time he stopped on a Friday, the Muslim holy day.
The Great Mosque of Jenne dates back to the 13th century. It looks like something from outer space, but for me it's as sublime as the cathedral at Notre Dame. It's made entirely out of mud. After prayers, I meet the great Imam of Jenne, Mali's most revered cleric. <laughs> It's a great honor to, to meet you. It's, I feel like I'm meeting the Pope, but better. <laughs> so is there any way I can see inside the mosque? That we uh, uh, want to you to become Muslim. So, <laughs> I will hope to you to come into the mosque. If I become Muslim, I want four wives. Then this will become, it means that we will be close. We'll be brothers. Yes, we will be brothers, yes. You know that the Fulani are beautiful, and maybe he find for you a woman in his Fulani. Oh, good, say bon. Islam was introduced to the Niger River Valley by Arab traders in the 11th and 12th centuries. With Islam came the written word. Jenne is a traditional center of Islamic learning and it's still very devout. Children are sent here from all over West Africa to study. I'm joined by Bubakar Diaby, Jenny's head of conservation, and by Kevin McDonald, an archaeologist. It's very old, this word. Because it's not just one person who's utilizing this. You have generations and generations who have used this very same tablet in their studies. It's a textbook. Yes, it's a textbook. Bubakar, do they efface this? Do they sand it off and then begin again? Yes, uh, they, they have to watch it. Uh -huh. They watch the ink Yeah. Sometimes you even drink this water that you use for washing. That's it. It's a symbol that you're taking the Quran within you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Drinking in knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'll pass on it. <laughs> and what's very important is that during the 16th century, the hunger for knowledge was so great that the books were probably the most the important the of commercial exchanges. The mm -hmm. most important thing to commerce was books. Yeah. Well, you see, that's important because the image of black Africa is that the people are illiterate, traditionally. That doesn't happen at Jenné. So there's, no, there's no illiteracy in Jenné. seule ville en Afrique où il n'y a pas un seul illiterate. This is probably the only town in Africa where you don't have one single illiterate person. Not one single illiterate person. Everyone in Jenne knows how to read and write in Arab. À sept ans déjà, on sait bien lire et écrire en Arab. It's extraordinary. If the Kingdom of Mali was the grandest empire in West Africa, it wasn't the first. The earlier empire of Ghana dates back to the 9th century. But a civilization a thousand years older still has recently been discovered. Across the floodplain from Jenne are the remains of a town that dates back to 250 BC. 
Okay. A lot of narrow lanes snaking in between compounds. In some of these compounds you have black... Kevin McDonald helped with the archaeological excavations. Merchants perhaps selling out of their compounds, their wares. This entire mound was the city. If we were to brush away all of this pottery and begin to work fairly carefully, we'd find houses, we'd find compounds, and we could be very well walking along the line of an ancient street right now. And of course, also in this city, you would have had blacksmiths working. For instance, if you look here, this is uh, a bit of ironworking debris. Really? There was ironworking at the site from the earliest occupation, 250 BC, right to the abandonment. Well, but so many scholars said that iron couldn't possibly be this old in black Africa. Well, definitely, that's one point of view which is changing. Europeans once believed that civilization came to West Africa with the Arabs. But people here were living in towns long before the first Arab merchants crossed the Sahara in the 10th century. And they had their own way of burying their dead. They were perhaps exposed first or buried and then dug up, mm -hmm. and then their bones were redeposited inside these jars. Are they bones there? Secondary animations, that's right, those are human bones. So they had to be put in a, the fetal position? Perhaps even bound up uh, into that position, or you probably had a the rather grisly situation where you still had sinew holding the bones together, but the bodies were already well on the way to decomposition. That's a, that's a human skull there. What? Where? Right here. Looks like a young individual, maybe a child, a juvenile, sort of crushed in on that side. That's Ooh. a human skull. Yes. Never touched a human skull before. Now, what are they? That's the legs of someone. Huh. Just lying straight out there. So this was the head. That's right. That's the, the inside of the inside of the skull. That's the I have to say that I feel a bit like a grave robber as I poke around the bones of these 2,000-year-old human beings. These discoveries prove that the medieval kingdom of Mali and the great towns of Jene and Timbuktu grew out of a civilization as old as the Roman Empire. When Islam arrived in Mali, most people embraced it. But south of Jene, away from the main trading routes, the Dogon people held on to an older way of life. The Dogon migrated to these hills in the 15th century to escape conversion to Islam. According to Dogon legend, a snake, their oldest ancestor, led them here and gave them the gift of language. village generously offers me Dogon beer. With all those guns going off, how could I say no? High above the village lies the sacred place where boys are circumcised. The ceremony is a crucial event in the life of every Dogon boy. Here is uh, the place for the circumcision. We have to see the kids and the old man who cut the sex uh -huh. and he stay here. Is that this is, a blood stain? Yes, it's the blood. Huh. Blood for the... So how old are the boys when they do it? The kids are uh, 15 and 14. 15 and 14. 14. 
Were you circumcised here? Oh, un un lungon kondo kundi ama. Mina san so san eme nona kundi. It's 1960. He was circumcised. Yeah. Yeah. Did it hurt? Wa, we are going to be mawa. Can can ni? No. Me and the gambinga ga ga barum kanya me gambin kanene. No. It would hurt me. <laughs> Each boy paints a symbol on the walls of the cave, which relates to a complex theory of heaven and earth. The Dogon are dogged defenders of their religion and their customs. Do they do they circumcise girls here? Yaulumbe lengwan kondo kundudma. Yaulumbe me jinda me bima de anakudla tulla. Okay, the circumcision for the girls down in the village mm. is not the same time. Uh, for the boys, uh, 15 or 14. Hmm. For the girls, about uh, three years. I think so they do it when the girls are three years yes, old? Yes, three, three years, years, four years. I see. Yeah. The government is trying to ban circumcisions of girls. Um, how do the people in the village feel about that? Uh, now in the villages, the government don't come to look in the villages what the people are doing about uh, the circumcision. <laughs> okay, he said here, in the continues. It continues. Maybe they will left. Maybe they continues. Maybe. Yes, maybe. Okay. It's not true. Mm. Yeah. Like the slavery I found in Mopti, female circumcision is a custom whose barbarity no appeal to tradition can ever justify. Once a year, the village performs the Yang Joy Dance. The ceremony celebrates the dead and calls their spirits from the afterworld to help the living. Islamic Mali. It was time to begin the final leg of my journey. I head back to Mopti to wait for the ferry to Timbuktu. The boat was due at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Around about midnight, it finally arrived. Captain takes me to my deluxe cabin, apparently the finest on the boat. Even today, Timbuktu is difficult to get to. The ferry runs for six months a year, and the roads are only passable in the dry season. The journey is scheduled to take two days and two nights, nearly 400 miles downriver. I'll travel through the great inland delta and along the southern fringes of the Sahara Desert. Barbecued Pringles. <laughs> A bottle of 1992 Bone. My wife, who couldn't be on this trip, packed this 
as a care package and I'm supposed to open it during my river journey. And these are banana chips. But most important of all, wipes. For anyone who's traveled in the third world, wipes are crucial, as is emodium. The two are directly connected. I'm traveling with two suitcases. It looks like these people brought their whole house. Before the 19th century, no European had reached Timbuktu. The Muslim world fiercely protected their lucrative trading routes. In 1824, the French Geographical Society offered a prize of 10,000 francs to the first person who set foot in the city and returned to tell the tale. There were only two ways to reach Timbuktu. Across the Sahara Desert, or down the river Niger, like me. At least 150 explorers died in the attempt. That evening, we reached the town of Akka. And Akka's market comes out to meet us. Just in time for dinner. Captain, when will we arrive in Timbuktu? Timbuktu? Le. Well, tomorrow. Tomorrow uh, morning, uh, afternoon? Morning, morning. Okay. Tomorrow morning. Why are we running late? It's like the people who are in the city, they have passed the city, and they have to go to the city, and they have to go to the city. We are in the period of the city, so we have to go to the city. I wasn't exactly reassured to learn that the ferry sometimes runs aground and can be stuck for days. The captain said they must respect the spirits who control the river. But despite the delays, I was beginning to enjoy the rhythms of the river. And compared to those European explorers who tried to reach Timbuktu, my journey is like a pleasure cruise. Captain James Riley kept a diary. We had no drink other than the camel's urine, which we caught in our hands as they voided it. Its taste was bitter, but not salt, 
and it relieved our fainting spirits. We were forced to keep up with the drove, but in the course of the day, found a handful of snails each, which at night we roasted and ate. Our feet, though not swollen, were extremely sore. Our bodies and limbs were nearly deprived of skin. Each evening in the first class lounge, they play the same old African MTV video. Night after night after night. As we get closer to Timbuktu, the desert sands close in. I begin to worry whether the fabled city can live up to all my expectations. The French explorer René Caillé won the Geographical Society race. He arrived in Timbuktu in 1828, disguised as a Muslim speaking fluent Arabic. But Caillé was bitterly disappointed by what he found. He wrote of a mass of ill-looking houses immense plains of quicksand, and a profound silence. Caillé was at least 200 years too late. Timbuktu had long been in decline. The Moroccans had invaded. The desert trade had lost ground to faster sea routes. And salt was no longer worth its weight in gold. Today, Timbuktu streets are not so much paved with gold as lined with sand. Timbuktu is almost destitute, but for me, there is something magical about this place. The Sankaray Mosque has been the object of my dreams for almost 40 years. In the 16th century, this was the heart of a great Islamic school system and university that once had links with Cordoba and Cairo. My guide, 
Ali Sidi is an Islamic scholar. According to historians, this university was counting 25,000 students. 25,000 students? Yeah. Huh. What did they study? Well, they studied too many fields like uh, uh, astronomy, uh, literature, uh, Islamic sciences, uh -huh. the Quran, the mathematics. Uh, medicine? Uh, medicine, yeah, traditional medicine. Hmm. So they would study in these rooms? They were, st they were studying in these rooms uh, in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the, in the afternoon, of courses are given in that court. In the court. How long did it take to get through well, the upper level? It's about uh, 10 years. So that's and like getting a BA, bachelor's degree yeah. and then a PhD yeah. today. And once you get graduated, you get your diploma mm -hmm. and you also get the traditional turban. A turban? Yeah. Now, would the scholars come from all over black Africa or they mostly from, from Mali? From black Africa, mm. from West Africa. Mm -hmm. And most of them were taken in charge by the local population and by traditional chiefs. For me, the shadows of these scholars haunt the streets. Timbuktu began life in the 12th century, when Tuareg nomads from the desert set up camp by a well. In time, it became a trading post, the port on the Sea of Sand. By the 16th century, Timbuktu was at its peak. Scholars and students were drawn here, and a trade in books developed. Thousands of these old manuscripts survive, hidden away here in private collections. Ali Sidi takes me to see Hydera and his family library. This book is about poetry. It's about poetry. Poetry. The author is using local languages. African languages. Yeah, African languages. In like 16th Pula. century. Um, and the second part of the book is dealing with astronomy. Mm. Yeah. Astronomy. You know, astronomy was well used in yeah. the 16th century. The Tuareg still uses astronomy. Yeah. Mm. You know, mm. This one? Yeah. Uh, this is about mathematics. Mathematics? <laughs> yeah. Algebra, <laughs> geometry, uh, what? Mm, I think it's more about accounting. Accounting. Yeah. Mokto was having uh, the trade, trans, the trans Saharan trade. Mm -hmm. This one. What's it about? Uh, this manuscript is dealing with the slavery history. Slavery? Yeah. Each correspondence is a document, it's giving uh, elements about the price. Or the cost of, of the person. Yeah, of a person. Huh. You, uh, Hydra, my ancestors were slaves. They could be in this book. Can you see if there are any Gateses in here? <laughs> I don't know. Gonna, I don't know. <laughs> What's his name? Or her name? Gates, Abdul Gates. Gates. <laughs> Abdul Gates. <laughs> it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And these are books written by black people. Uh, uh, some of them were, were written by, uh, mm. by uh, black people. When I was growing up, that school books said... I'm going to tell you that here in, in Timbuktu, we had big black scholars. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you at least one example. During the 16th century, we had Ahmed Baba, uh -huh. who wrote at least 60 volumes. 60 himself? 60 himself, mm. yeah. That's great. But when I was growing up, the school books said Africans couldn't read and write, didn't have any books, and here this great library exists. Yeah, indeed it is. Not at the thing, how would it uh, I cannot, he cannot say that African do not write. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I know. Because he saw too many authors who are from Africa. Right. Yeah. It's Sebon. Yeah. And this is not this, the only place they are keeping books. They have another library. Mm. Mm. In Timbuktu. Yeah, in Timbuktu.
the mind of the black world locked into the pages of these priceless books. Evidence of a grand civilization, untranslated and unknown. To tell the truth, I've always half feared that Timbuktu would prove to be a mirage. Just another story spun by those brothers back home in the barbershop. I've dreamed about coming to Timbuktu since that day when I first heard about this place. I see this courtyard is surrounded by black men with long gowns and turbans, which they received as their um, sign of their degree when they graduated. And each of them carrying books, this whole place surrounded by books, precisely when Europeans said that black Africans lack the intellectual ability to ever to learn to read and write. This place, founded just about the time of the University of Paris or the University of Bologna or Charles in, in Prague, and fully 311 years before my own beloved Harvard, this place was brimming with 25,000 students and scholars gathered from all over black Africa and North Africa who had come here because this was Africa's great center of learning. It's enough to make you cry. Timbuktu, where salt was worth its weight in gold, and gold was spent on books. He had found in the far interior a ruined city which he believed to be the Ophir of the Bible. This story of an ancient civilization long since lapsed into the darkest barbarism took a great hold of my imagination. This is a passage from the 19th century bestseller King Solomon's Mines. It was published in 1885 when Europe was on the point of carving up Africa. Ryder Haggard's adventure story became the ultimate colonial fantasy about lost cities hidden deep in the dark continent. When Europeans did come upon real ruined cities, they refused to believe that they had been built by Africans. As a black American, I know what it's like to have your history stolen from you. Here in Southern Africa, the past has repeatedly been distorted and denied, and I'm on a journey to find out why. What's the word? Johannesburg said, what's the word? That was a Gil Scott Heron song when I was an undergraduate in college. That was our fight song, the liberation song to free South Africa. And like many people my generation, I made a vow I would never come here, never come to Johannesburg, never come to South Africa until Nelson Mandela was free and until South Africa was free. And now Mandela's out of prison and South Africa politically is free. Apartheid, thank God, has now ended. And South Africa is just beginning to search for a new identity. So it's an exciting time to be here. But to be perfectly honest, I don't think that South Africa will be truly free until its people can feel proud of their own history. This is a journey in search of Southern Africa's ancient past. From Johannesburg, I'll be traveling 500 miles north on the trail of lost cities. From South Africa, I'll then cross the Limpopo River and head to my final destination, Great Zimbabwe, the magnificent stone city that inspired King Solomon's mines. Okay, the room is just up here. The restaurant I just saw was just down the passage. Mm -hmm.
I'm staying at a fashionable Johannesburg hotel. It seems so strange to think that under apartheid, I wouldn't have been allowed to stay here. Can I get, do um, you have a health club? Yes, we do have one. Good. And it's just down uh, below the restaurant. Let me show you the facilities of the room. Mm -hmm. Over here we have the TV switch. The TV is housed in the cabinet over TV's there. in here? That's right. And it is marked with TV. Just press it and the TV Whoa. will come up from the box. Check that out. But the only time I ever saw that was once in Las Vegas. Well, this is Africa now. <laughs> South Africa has it. <laughs> Pretty tricky. Yes, let me show you the patio. Here. Yeah. After you. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a view. It's brilliant up here. And let me show you around here just to get your bearings. Over there is the zoo. The zoo? That's right. Where's downtown Joburg? It will be to the right over the hill over there. It's beautiful. It's now, is this mostly a white area? Yes, it is. There are quite a few black families moving into these areas here. Mm -hmm. But it's middle class. That's right. Mm -hmm. The truth is, the majority of black people still live just outside of Johannesburg, in the vast township of Soweto. The last time I visited South Africa, this was the one place that I really wanted to take my teenage daughters. In 1976, over a hundred Sowetan schoolchildren were shot dead by the security forces in an uprising against apartheid. I want to know about South Africa's past, recent and ancient. I'm with graduate history student, Safiso Undelovu. I'm surprised that it's a city, Soweto. I mean, it's, the image you have in the West is that it's one big ghetto with just people in shanty towns, but there are middle-class neighborhoods, there are lower-class neighborhoods, upper-class neighborhoods, is that right? Because if you remember, black people were supposed to live in a particular place. However rich they were, they were not allowed to go and live in well-developed places as such. They had to live in an area which was designated for blacks. Hello, Mama. Hello. Thank you. Uh, how are you? Fine, thank, thank you for you. letting it's me come to your home. You're welcome. Thank you. Safiso is eager for me to get a taste of what life is really like here. He wants me to meet his mother. And then we're going to see a young Soweto band called Boob Shaka. They've caused quite a stir with their latest hit, a funky version of the new national anthem in Kosi Sikalela. Your, your son's a good driver. He is. Did you teach him? Somebody did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Somebody did. Okay. It's one of the Soweto houses. Ah, thank you. Okay. But we try to make it, make it comfortable. See you, man. Yeah. Do you like the music? Do you yeah. like Boom Shaka? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, for the youth, it's okay. I think Nkosi Sikalele is one of the most beautiful songs that I've ever heard. Especially with the mass choir. I enjoy it more with the mass choir. Mm. It's beautiful to hear Nkosi Sikalele. Mm. Did you learn it when you went to school? Did you have to sing it? No. I went to school long ago. Probably you were singing God Save the Queen. We were singing God Save the Queen at that time. I really want to talk to Safiso about the impact that apartheid had on the way that history was taught in South Africa. The official version used to be that there were no black people living here when the Dutch arrived in 1652. But things are changing. Safiso is on a new degree course studying pre-colonial history. Why do you think pre-colonial history wasn't offered before? Pre-colonial history wasn't offered before because of the obvious fact that history can serve as an ideological tool for whoever is in power. So the person who was in power, the, the African nationalist, made it a point that their own version of history will, will, will take effect. So in a way, what you do in that instance, you decide to push to the back the history of the, of the people who have been here. You start your, your timeline, if I may say, your chronology when, as a, as a colonist, when you arrived. So 1652. Then 1652. When the Europeans came. When the Euro Europeans came. So, when was, you, so school children in South Africa were taught that before 1652... There was nothing. Nothing. This was an empty land. And they came with the, the myth of the empty land. They came with the various theories that 
most of the African people that you find here migrated from sub-Saharan Africa and probably they reached these shores the same time as the white people in 1652. And so then it was survival of the fittest. Then it's survival of the fittest. Uh, Safiso, what do you think the, uh, the importance of this course is to you and to black people in South Africa? We have our roots here in South Africa. And for a person who lives in the present, he has to know where he comes or where she comes from. It took 200 years for anyone to jazz up the Star Spangled Banner. And when Jimi Hendrix did, it almost caused a riot. Some South Africans are offended that their national anthem has been turned into a pop song, but I think it sounds pretty good. Perhaps Sifiso and Boom Shaka are the face of the new South Africa, vital, enthusiastic, building the future from an imperfect past. For most people, however, the more ancient past is another country. If I ask a South African where to find an ancient city, they'd probably tell me to drive a couple of hours from Johannesburg to a place called the Palace of the Lost City. This place claims to be the reconstruction of an ancient African city, but it's as fictional as Sleeping Beauty's castle. Jerry Allison, the architect, builds magnificent theme parks all over the world. This particular fantasy cost $260 million. Jerry, what's, what's this place called? This is called the Monkey Springs Plaza. Well, there's a monkey spring. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you a bit about it. One of the great things about this project was the group of artisans and designers that came together and bought into the whole f fantasy we were building. One of them was the designer of the uh, casino named Henry Conversano. Henry came up with the story about the uh, monkeys that saved the village at one time during a great drought. And they had treated the monkeys wonderfully during their lifetime. So to help save the village, they went to the treetops, gathered the fruits, came down, squeezed the fruits, and created the juice for the for the village people, which so, saved them. And so this the, is done in their honor. Oh, so the monkeys are the saviors of the village. And the water represents the juice from the fruits that they brought down to the villagers. Ah. Without that, the village may well have perished. How does this connect to the Monkey Plaza? The Monkey Plaza is sort of the focal point of the Bridge of Time. This is the Bridge of Time. And the Bridge of Time leads into the Cavern of Treasures, where they kept the treasures of the, of the village. Did you build the cracks in, or they knew? No. As a matter of fact, every time I come across here, I find new cracks uh, caused by the volcanic and earthquake action. So I'm really kind of shaky when I go across this bridge. So you never know when the earthquake. I never know. Boy, wait a minute. I hear some sound. I get a little worried when I hear that rumbling. <laughs> oh, boy. It could happen any time now. <laughs> Jerry has even engineered an earthquake on the hour, every hour. Back on stable ground, it's so easy to be seduced by this fantasy of a palatial African past. I wonder what other visitors make of it all. Have you been here before? Yeah, I've been yeah. here before. What do you think? Oh, truly magnificent. 
yeah. art of the world, one of the new wonders of the world, <laughs> the eighth wonder of the world. Do you think it was based on history? Yes, I think it's surely based on history. Look at the background there, it's totally African. You are now seeing Africa, what Africa used to look like mm -hmm. in those days. What's supposed to be, what yeah. Africa supposed to be. What is supposed to be. Truly African tourists from all over the world come to this place. The tourists seem to like it here. I'm curious to know what Jerry's historical inspiration was. Well, it's kind of a childhood dream. Uh, I'd always read uh, the Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, and seen, of course, all of the uh, uh, movies of Indiana Jones and uh, African Queen, and I was very intrigued by the possibility of, of presenting the guest that kind of an Africa, particularly in an area that had very little history, an architectural history practically zero in this area. Not much history, you think? No, there were some remains of um, foundations of old huts and so on, but nothing of the scale of this. Do you think that the, by using um, Tarzan as an inspiration or, or, you know, the stories of King Solomon's mines? Those things. Yeah, that you were reinforcing stereotypes about Africa or changing the stereotypes about Africa? Uh, it was reflecting the stereotypes, you might say, because none of the things you see here ever really occurred in any of the movies either. Mm -hmm. It was a case of art trying to develop an architecture and an environment that we thought would portray Africa to the visitor. Mm -hmm. And you think you've succeeded? I think so. And at the same time, we didn't want to insult the African themselves because they were very, very proud people and very beautiful people to work with. Oh, that's great. This is all great fun. My daughters would love it. But it's sad that most of us know so very little about African history except what we learn from films like Tarzan or Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's so much more to Africa than European fantasies. I'm heading to Pretoria, the seat of South Africa's government, to talk to someone who can help me separate the facts from the fiction. Martin Hall is an archaeologist who can spot a colonial fantasy from 20 paces. We've arranged to meet at Pretoria's Union Buildings. It's not exactly the most uh, African-looking building <laughs> I've seen. No, this is one of the great imperial dreams. Uh, the Union Buildings in Pretoria is a sort of dream of empire. Uh, the idea of the, of the sun never setting on the British Empire. Very similar to the architecture of New Delhi. So oh, it is? Mm-hmm. Hmm. When was it built? It was built in the early years of this century when the idea was very much that um, South Africa was part of the process of painting the whole continent pink for the British Empire, you know, all the way from the Cape to Cairo. The whitening. The whitening and the civilizing. Oh, that's amazing. And this is still the seat of government? This is still one of the seats of government, yes. So Mandela's here, I mean, this is where he runs yeah, the, no, the country? Yeah, this is uh, still the symbolic center of uh, government. I've just come from the palace of the lost city. Right. <laughs> That's another dream, another dream of, uh, of, of power in Africa. How seriously should we take that? Oh, well, you have to take it seriously and you have to not take it seriously. You have to take it seriously and of course that many people believe that that's the real Africa. Well, in fact, that's what happened. I asked yeah. people, do you think this was a historical reality? And many people said absolutely. Yeah, and it's based very much on the idea that, uh, that Africa has no history of its own, um, that that history is available to be um, invented and discovered and imagined and created and one of the crucial things that must happen in South Africa is, 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 a, is a rediscovery of that history, mm -hmm. um, a rediscovery of the real richness of the, of the pre-colonial past, of the, of the early history of Africa, of the richness of those pre-colonial city-states and it's most unfortunate that this myth um, is perpetuated in such a fun-loving way today because it obscures the uh, you know, the work of, 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 of rediscovering that history. It makes people like me sound like sort of real politically correct killjoys of <laughs> arguing um, that this isn't the way that things should be shown. And in many respects, one of the ironies is, is that uh, popularized history, theme park history, could probably be much more interesting and much more exciting mm -hmm. if it really took recognition of the real richness of the history of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, because at the moment, it's unnecessarily shallow.
hot coins. No, thank you. How much? It's three each. Is it a special? Oranges, how much? Tangerines? Seven. Yes, sir. Seven? Yes, for you. Uh, okay, I'll take ten. Ah, uh, sir. Yes. Here it is. Uh, seven rand? Yes. Here's the big one. Let me get some money. Yeah. Well, he is it. No, How much are these? Uh, seven rents. You buy for me. You can. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I buy for this one. Uh, so for me. I'm a small one. I'm a small man. Ah, uh, my bosom. Ah, uh, uh, sir. Take you. another one, bosom. This region is full of history. There are real lost cities in South Africa. This is where my journey into the past begins. 500 miles north of Pretoria, near the border with Zimbabwe, there's a forgotten city that's almost a thousand years old. It's called Mapungubwe. It's not so easy to find Mapungubwe. Johan Filmater, who manages the site, has offered to take me there. Mapungubwe was discovered 70 years ago. Since then, it's been owned and excavated by the University of Pretoria, a traditionally conservative institution. Under apartheid, it was not in their interest, or the government's, to admit that they had discovered an ancient African city here. And because of this, Few people in South Africa have ever heard of Mapungubwe. But in Nelson Mandela's South Africa, things are changing. National parks have taken over the site. It's not yet open to the public, but I've been given special permission to look around. Yeah. Johan, what are those holes? These holes are here where they put stakes in and use it as a, a steps going up into the... As a ladder? Area. As a sort of a ladder, you know. Huh. Did, yeah. did you find the ladder so maybe we can use it? <laughs> so I don't have to try to kill myself on that rope. <laughs> no, I think we must use the rope. The ladder is gone. Okay, well, I guess we have to do it, right? Okay. So you just pull yourself up? No, you just pull yourself up. But just before you go, what I think we should do is just give this rope a bit of a shake. Well, what's that for? Um, there's normally, or there's sometimes a quite nice, nice black mamba staying in this one. Right? <laughs> Don't mess with it. <laughs> is it one really? Is it really? Yeah, really, yeah. Huh. It's mostly in summer, so it's yeah. <laughs> Does it like black people? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here I go. So we're going up sideways. Unfortunately, the only entrance to the site is up this narrow gorge. <sighs> Just... There they go. Straight up here. Boy, nobody was gonna find these brothers up here. <laughs> nobody. Right. Okay. There's not much left up here now, and the stone walls have all gone. But at its peak, this was a thriving city. Well, I bet they didn't get a lot of visitors up here. I doubt it. <laughs> Oh, you see all the sand up here? The sand? Yeah, this, this soil that we see underneath our feet here. You can see bits of rock sticking out here. Yeah. Some people say that they actually carried all the sand up here. They carried it up? Yeah, in, in, in pots, in, this, in, the, in the pots that they pick up. Came up that little up gully this, that I came up. Gully that we came up, yeah. God, that's pretty good. Yeah, so it was, must have been quite a hard work if you think the size of this yeah. mountain with all the sand on it. How often do you think they went down? I mean, did they go down and farm or something, or do they stay up here most of the time? The kings themselves had, had people communicate to the masses at the bottom, to the people, labor, or workers at the bottom. So I doubted whether they ever actually went down to the to the people themselves. You mean the king stayed the up king here? The king stayed up here. His water got brought up for him here, and his, and his sand was here to plant his crops and do all these things, so he could do everything up top here. Huh. So he was isolated. I've got one of my guards here that said he'll see if we can't find some of that last bead. Matibula. Here, there you can. Hmm. Well, I got some. Wow, well, look at that. You got some of the glass beads? Yeah, it really is. These, these little things, yeah. Oh, that's great. So they had to trade all the way to the sea to get these glass beads. Yeah, yeah. They say far across the ocean. Yes, the, it comes to a bowl. So people say that they, they were bringing in 
They were trading with people from the east. Uh -huh. Some of the people you mean from the China, east. Yes, with the glasses, yeah. Wow. And you work here? Yeah, in the National Parks Board. You're like a park ranger? Yeah. Ah, yeah. and you find these things every day? Yeah. So they've been here a thousand years, just yeah. sitting here? Yeah, it's more a thousand years, yes. Oh, amazing. We now know that Mapungubwe is one of hundreds of similar ancient towns in southern Africa. People here were already living in settled communities a thousand years ago. So much for the apartheid theory that this was an empty land. A wealth of intricate gold figures and fine pottery has been found here. For the past 70 years, they have been locked away in a basement at Pretoria University. Some of the less spectacular finds are still stored in this shed. Some of them, yes. Okay, this is it. As you can see, this is mostly pot shells and bits and pieces of rock lying around here. Mm. Um, you can look around, there should be boxes like this with just a little beads. Oh. It's been collected in them. That's still there. Right, these beads are made of. There's an ostrich shell. Oh, there they are. Like, yeah. Oh. Johan, all of these precious materials kept in this terrible structure. I mean, there's a hole in the roof. These boxes are covered with bird droppings and their water stain. It must break your heart. Yeah. So you, you hope this has changed? Yeah, it will change. They're really busy with packing up and clearing up and taking it to a safe place. Oh, good. Because it's a shame for it to survive a thousand years and then be ruined in this building. Definitely. In many ways, this everyday material is just as valuable as the gold objects. It's the key to understanding an ancient African civilization. And it's riding away in these crumbling boxes. Whatever the politics were, it's tragic that anyone, especially a university, could neglect this unique site. Uh, I found, uh, Professor Mayer from Pretoria University has been involved in the excavations at Mapungubwe for nearly 30 years. These amazing artifacts are just a few of many found at Mapungubwe. I'm one of the few people ever to have seen them in person. This table's a feast of wonders. Were they um, sophisticated users of gold? Yes, if you look, for instance, at these beads, and we have literally 10,000 beads of very small, uh, similar size. And, and this, is this gold? This is also gold. And both, as you can see, these things were made of leaf gold fastened to a wooden core with small, tiny tacks. And there you are. I'm petrified. Yes, it, well, uh, it should be honored because it probably linked to a king and uh, it seems to fit you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I like the way you think. What about this little gentleman over here? Well, the most famous rhinoceros in the world. It is unique. Have we found anything in any other part of Africa this beautiful at this time, this complicated? I mean, that rhinoceros is amazing to me. Yeah, the closest we come to that are the Zimbabwe soapstone birds. So these it, people are on a par with the best of civilization in other parts of the world? Yes, I think so. Why don't South Africans know about this aspect of their own history? That is a frequently asked question. I think that's a very good one. During the past two decades, we learned a lot about the human past of South Africa. And at that time, the existing education system did not provide for that kind of evidence. And it was very difficult to change minds. It's only now with the new redo of education and so on that we have an opportunity to do that. So it might well be a, an opportunity for you to make a breakthrough with this in a new book. <laughs> well, thanks for you too. Good. But you mean, you said very politely, if I'm understanding you correctly, that under apartheid, mm -hmm. this sort of evidence about black people mm -hmm. creating a civilization was Taboo. They did not want people to know that. Well, is that um, correct? Yes. Uh, the first place history was very Eurocentric. Right. That was a, um, a very almost stereotype sort of picture of South Africa's mm. past, mm. and it was difficult to change that. Well, I hope things are changing. It's about time these treasures were shown to the public.
I'm on my way to Tulamela, another stone city that has recently been uncovered. These are the northern provinces. This was once the Afrikaner frontier, and it's still very conservative. Messina is the main town along the way. It feels just like Piedmont, West Virginia, the small southern town where I grew up in the 1950s. I'm staying at a popular Afrikaner holiday camp. Not so long ago, most Afrikaners supported apartheid. So I'm a bit nervous about spending the evening with them. When I hear, yeah, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man that's heaven to you. But I will walk 500 miles and I will walk 500 more to be the man who walks a thousand miles to fall right at your door. West Virginia. And you all remind me of West Virginians. So that's why I want to sing this song to you tonight. Cool. Okay? Country road, take me home to the place I belong. Karaoke may not have taught the world or me to sing in perfect harmony, but it does seem to have broken down some barriers. The ruins of Tulamela were discovered seven years ago in the Kruger National Park. This is one of the largest game parks in the world. It's about the size of New Jersey. Levy Dubé is my companion and my driver for the journey. People come from all over the world to come to Kruger National Park or any game park. Yeah. And you never see that many black people. And I wonder why. Yeah, I, I'll say, I mean, black people really, they don't like coming to see animals. They think you know, to them it's not worth it to pay for their money to come and see animals. <laughs> They eat their crops, these elephants, and then they hate them. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of paying money to come see them, forget it. Forget it. <laughs> at Tulamela, like at Mapungubwe, the University of Pretoria was also involved in the excavations. But in the new spirit of post-apartheid openness, it's been handled very differently. This site is open to the public. The curator is Israel Nemaheni. What sort of things were found here? Uh, we found uh, a lot of gold beads, 291 gold beads, and if you can have a look on these photographs. Firstly, I'll first show you the, the, the photograph of uh, the human remains of a, of a, of a female person. Uh -huh. And uh, we named her Losha because she was in a Losha position. And, and what's the Losha position? It's uh, a position in which vendor women uh, squat on the ground to respect their husbands and respect most respected people in the community uh -huh. yeah in fact the first thing that we found was the, the, the gold bangle around her right hand side uh -huh. this right um, you, you can oh, see, see it, it. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and uh, after it was uh, excavated it was it was just like this it's beautiful yeah and um, around her neck we realized that there were 291 wow. gold beads did they find her remains right here the the bones were found here right here yeah and they were buried here Queen Losha was given a Christian reburial by the people who live around here. Then where was the king's chamber? Over that side. Good. Can we go? Yeah. Okay. The black community has been involved in this excavation from the very start. They think of Tulamela as part of their rightful heritage. How many people lived here? Oh, uh, not more than 2,000. 2,000? Yeah. There's a lot of people. Yeah, there were a lot of people. Tulamela was built by the Shona people about 800 years ago. Descendants of the people who built Mapungubwe. They farmed and herded cattle and traded down the rivers as far as the Indian Ocean. That's how life was, and the king was the most supreme person 
in the village. This was the king's chamber? Yeah, probably so. This could have been the, the, the king's chamber. This is what we think. Yeah. So the people around the king, they would protect <coughs> him, they would entertain him? Yeah, yeah, they have to, to entertain him. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them would have to protect him, for instance, the, the, the uh, diviner had to sit somewhere at the entrance. The diviner, the holy man? Yeah, yeah, to see if you are not coming to post threat to the chief. And he could just tell by your aura? Yeah. That's a pretty handy thing to have. Yeah. I like that diviner thing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Israel, this is such a well-developed site. What do you think the implications are for reconstructing South African history? When it was realized that this um, site was settled here between 1200 and 1640, then people are starting to realize that black people were here before Europeans came, mm. and it's going to help in the rewriting of the South African history. Oh, that's wonderful. Tula Mela makes me feel hopeful. Institutions and people do seem to be changing. And here, there's a genuine desire to make the past important and accessible to everyone. Driving north, leaving South Africa, I'm on my way to the one ancient African city that many people have heard of, Great Zimbabwe. The country has even been named after it. On the way to the Zimbabwe border, I stop for a break on the outskirts of a town. Hi, what's your name? <laughs> I'm Albert Madow. Albert? Yeah. Hi, my name, I'm Professor Gates. Yeah. People seem to be very poor here. Very, very poor. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of problems. I mean, look at the people here. But, we are living in like a, you know, we, we, it's like a, you know, a, what, a dark house. Could I see your home? Well, we can. We can come and see my house. Is it far? Not far. So we can walk? Yeah, we can walk. Okay, let's yeah. do it. Albert, where did you learn to speak English? You, you sound like an American. <laughs> my mother used to work for a white American. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Did you live with them? Uh, I beggars? Did you live? I used to. Uh, I see. Yeah, How I old were you? I beggars? How old were you then? Oh, I was, I was around 14, 15. Ah. Yeah. So you sound like a soul brother, man. <laughs> yeah, Somewhere. because in those days, you know, it sounded like an American was like your, your, your super black person. Oh, a super you know black person. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, you know, you know, you know, compared with with a, with a, with a black person that's straight. You know ah, what I'm saying? I see. And so could, it was better. You could get a better girlfriend. A better girlfriend. Huh? <laughs> yeah. so you're a dog. <laughs> you're a dog. That's what it is. <laughs> In 1994, when Nelson Mandela came to power, he pledged to build one million low-cost homes. These are some of them. Albert, how many people live in here? Three people: mother, my younger brother, and myself. So you sleep on the floor? Mother sleep on the floor. You and the brother in the bed? Mm, Shelby, mm -hmm. single bed. And no electricity? No electricity. So what do you use, candles or? I will use all these, all these candles, lamp, homemade lamp, so oh. lamp. What's this? this? Mayonnaise bowl, hmm? mayonnaise bottle. Mayonnaise bottle? Yeah. Mayonnaise bottle? Mayonnaise bottle. This is kerosene, gasoline? This is power fan. Paraffin. Yeah. Hmm. How long does this last? If you light it, how an yeah, hour? An hour, an hour next hour, but it, it could take or three or four days. Three or four days? Yeah. Oh, okay. In other families, they have six people, ten people. Ten people, whatever. You know, run like this. I'm telling you. Hmm. Suffering. I'm sorry, brother. Yeah. Albert, thank you, brother. Thanks a lot, brother. It's been a great morning. <laughs> yeah, it's so, been a great morning, too. Listen, good luck at Brand University. Okay. And uh, do well, then come to Harvard, see me. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try back the problem this morning. The money? Yeah. You're smart, they'll give you the money. <laughs> Listen, Thanks you lie to me, okay? Okay, I'll write you. Okay, tell your Thanks. mother I said hi. Sure. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's so hard to judge as an outsider. You know, you come here with all your own values, you don't stay very long, and you can risk sounding arrogant. But that said, when I look at these houses, even the new houses that the government is providing, 
all those people crowded into one room with no electricity and no running water and no sanitation. It's going to take a thousand years for the black South Africans to catch up in the post-apartheid society. And that's sad. When so many South Africans still live in such poverty, I can understand that rewriting history is not the government's first priority. I'm crossing the Zimbabwe border what Rudyard Kipling called the Great Gray Green Greasy Limpopo River. Zimbabwe has been independent for nearly 20 years, 14 years longer than South Africa. I wonder if those extra years of freedom have made a difference. Zimbabwe was once the British colony called Rhodesia, named after the imperialist Cecil John Rhodes. I'm staying in the spectacular Matopo Hills, one of the country's most sacred spiritual sites where Rhodes chose to be buried. Where is Rhodes actually buried? Oh, he's buried up in those borders. It's uh, the world's view. Oh, it's called world's view? Yes. Up there? Yes. Well, let's go see it. Okay. Calvert and Como, my guide, told me that Rhodes died in 1902 of a heart attack. He wished to be buried here as a symbol of his mastery over the African people whose land he had taken. When I was growing up, I would have given anything to be a Rhodes scholar and study at the University of Oxford. If Cecil Rhodes had known how many black people would receive Rhodes scholarships, I think he probably would have still another heart attack. Rhodes had a favorite expression, which was, I prefer land to niggers. But when it came to choosing a place to be buried, he chose this place, the sacred ground of the Indabeli people. Calvert, what happened on the day that Rhodes was buried here? Um, and there were thousands of uh, Indabeli people here, and they wanted to witness his burial. And then the whites, they wanted to shoot as the gun salute. But the Ndebele people asked them not to shoot because they believed they might disturb their spirits in these hills. And their spirits were called Valindizim, which means the dwelling place of the benevolent spirits. Mm -hmm. The Ndebele did their own salute, which is Vaete, Vaete, Vaete. it's beautiful. What does it mean in English? It means we are burying a white man. Forgive us. I have to admit I feel uncomfortable that Rhodes should be buried here in this sacred African site. But perhaps it's right that he should be commemorated. After all, Zimbabwe can't simply wipe out the history it doesn't like. Later that evening, I arrive in Bulawayo, 
I'm reminded of Rhodes' famous dream of a British empire stretching from the Cape to Cairo. In the morning, Levy takes me to catch the bus to Great Zimbabwe. There's a market here every day? Yeah, this is an everyday thing, everyday market. Everyday market? Yeah. This is the center of Bulawayo. This is the center of Bulawayo, where you can catch a bus wherever you want to go. What are those? This is a spoon to cook. You know, when you cook, you have to make the food. You first use that one to mix it. What, this one? Yeah, you first take that one, you mix it. Like this? Exactly. <laughs> like a mixer? <laughs> like a mixer. Okay. And then, in the end, you use this one. It's going to be a bit hard. Do you use them? Yes. Can you cook? Yeah, I can. A lot. African, I thought African men didn't cook, only women cook. <laughs> can you cook? A lot. I can do cook a lot. Okay. Yeah. I wash dishes in my house. Ah, that's nice. <laughs> oh, I want to get one of these for my wife. Which one? These ones? Yeah, the plate. Do we bargain? Let's try to bargain and okay. see. Is this some Maybe we'll win. How much is this one? 20. How about 10? No. No? How about uh, 11? No. Or 15? No. 60? No. 20 <laughs> bus. 20 finished? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll take this one. This one. This one. Yeah. OK? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Levy, Bye -bye. you're from Botswana. You live in South Africa. Right. You've been in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Are, are the people here, diff the black people, are they different in your experience than the, the people in South Africa? Yes, I would say they are far much different because uh, these people here, they are free, more free than the people down in South Africa. Huh. Yeah. So what's that mean? Do they act more um, independent? They or? act more independent mm. than on the other side. Mm. What about around white people? Are they Do they act differently or the same? Well, I would say the white people here, they are not as much different as you know they got along together with their black people as well in Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe which makes life easy for them but how about in South Africa in South Africa is a different thing altogether how's it different well I mean if you black you black if you watch you watch it's a different thing <laughs> <laughs> but here it's more of a unified society yeah uh, it's far more, more universal society really. no. it's 200 miles from Bulawayo to Great Zimbabwe about a four-hour bus ride Are you going to school? Yes, sir. You look like you're dressed for school. Yes. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. Oh, that's good. My brother's a doctor. And I'm going to Great Zimbabwe. Of course, I want you to tell me about what, what happened in Great Zimbabwe. Uh, that's why it was built by the Shona people. It was built by the Shona people? Yes, and uh, that's where they lived. Uh huh. And uh, they lived in dome shaped huts. Dome shaped huts? Yeah. Uh huh. And it was built by granite. Built, built, built out of granite? Yes. Okay. Do you know when? Uh, no, not exactly. About a long time ago? Yes. How do you know so much about it? Did you learn about it in school? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Did you learn about the British coming? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, save that for later, huh? Yes. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. It's no coincidence that the nation has renamed itself after Great Zimbabwe. But when white explorers first stumbled across this incredible city in 1871, they were unwilling to believe that Africans could have built anything this grand. Even a century later in the 1970s under white rule, guidebooks were censored by the government. Archaeologists were told to deny that this city was built by Africans. But in fact, at the beginning of the century, it had already been proven beyond doubt that this was the capital of a vast and thriving African state that lasted over 300 years. I'm meeting Weber Ndoro, a Zimbabwean archaeologist and an authority on Great Zimbabwe. 
Who were these people? I mean, who were these people who built such a great civilization? Roughly, these, these are the sort of Iron Age people, Bantu people. Iron Age is equivalent to the European Middle Ages. Middle Ages, yeah, medieval uh, period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that the, the Bantu Iron Age, but these are the ancestors uh, of the Shona people. Mm -hmm. We are now at the hill complex. Uh, this is the place where the king is supposed to have lived. The king lived in here? Yes. This is the servant's entrance? No, this, we are actually going through the main entrance. The main entrance? Why is it so small? Well, I think it's something to do with control, uh, trying to make sure that whoever gets to the king, uh, there is control and you, you don't get a crowd going in. Obviously, perhaps someone would welcome you here. Were they, were they short and thin? <laughs> <laughs> well, big people wouldn't go through this. No big people wouldn't go through here. Yes. <laughs> Well, but what do we know about daily life here? Where did the king sleep? Where did he go to the bathroom? Where did he bathe? <laughs> we don't have evidence of where he would sleep or in the bathroom or anything like that. But obviously those things uh, should have taken place. Water had to be brought up here by women, perhaps, you know, carrying it on, uh, on their heads. Through those narrow entryways? Yeah, through those narrow entrances. It's extraordinary how they use the rocks to, to build the walls. You will see that uh, they had some ideas of engineering, making sure that the wall doesn't slide down, right? But at the same time, covering the, the boulder. And by the way, this is the only entrance which hasn't been restored at Great Zimbabwe. It's brilliant. The word Zimbabwe means house of stone. And Great Zimbabwe is the largest stone structure in Africa, south of the pyramids. The grandest achievement of the civilization that founded Mapungubwe three centuries earlier. At its height in the 15th century, it had as large a population as many of Europe's greatest cities. What's the importance of Great Zimbabwe for Zimbabweans today? Well, uh, you know, uh, the fact that this country is named after uh, this site, uh, Zimbabwe is very important. It's a site which, you know, sort of, you know, can be used as a national symbol. People coming together, joining together. It has been used on flags, on the coin, on the money, stamps, and, and things like that. No ethnic group can really sort of, you know, uh, say this is ours. But each ethnic group can link to it. They they see it as, you know, uh, owned by the whole nation. So it's a vehicle for unity. Yeah, it's a vehicle for unity. It's a symbol for unity, and it's something which they can use even today. You guys are not Hello. Hey, how are you? Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? Okay, so? Fine, where are you all from? I'm are you from, from, around, from yeah. Zimbabwe. So you're from Zimbabwe, you're new? I'm originally from New York City, but I'm an educator in Michigan. In Michigan? I thought you were in America. <laughs> <laughs> Do you come here much? Is this your first time here? Actually, no. this is about my eighth time here. Eighth time? Yes. yes. And you? Almost uh, twice a week. You come twice a week, oh, so you must be a guy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. But you're not. What? No, I used to come on school trips uh, ever since I was in about primary school. We have to come here, I think, once a year. Oh, you have on to? On school trips, yeah. Every, every school child? Most school children do, they do. Most, Most of them, yeah. I think it's wonderful. It shows the genius of our people. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, the Europeans kept uh, coming up with theories saying that the Africans couldn't have built this. Did you know that? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it's wonderful to hear this sort of pride in this place. Who needs theme park fantasies when you've got real history like this? I love this place. There's nothing in all of Sub-Saharan Africa quite like Great Zimbabwe. And for that reason, it's not surprising that for over a century, many Europeans and many white South Africans and many white Rhodesians <laughs> did their best to prove that anybody but the Africans had built it. Arabs, Israelites, as they called them, or even Phoenicians, anybody but the Africans who lived here. But that's changed. Zimbabwe became independent in 1980, and since then, Great Zimbabwe has become a symbol of national unity, a symbol of the glory of the past and their hopes for the future. That process is only just beginning in South Africa. Discover the wonders of the African world at PBS Online. Set your browser from pbs.org.
Wonders of the African World with Henry Louis Gates Jr. was made possible with contributions 